Section one of Madame de Stal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Madame de Stal by Bella Duffy. Chapter one The Mother my dear friend having the same tastes as myself would certainly wish always for my chair and like his little daughter would beat me to make me give it up to him to keep peace between our hearts i send a chair for him also the two are of suitable height and their lightness renders them easy to carry they are made of the most simple material and were bought at the sale of filmont and Borqui thus wrote madame geoffrin to madame necker when the intimacy between them had reached such a pitch as to warrant the introduction into the necker salon of the only sort of chair in which the little old lady cared to sit the dear friend was monsieur necker and the little daughter of the house must then have been about four or five years old for it was in the very year of her birth seventeen sixty six that madame geoffrin took her celebrated journey to poland and it was some little time after her return that she became intimate with germaine necker's parents they were still in the rue de clary m necker's elevation to the control general was in the future and had probably not been foreseen it is possible that even the eloge de colbert which betrayed his desire for power had not yet appeared nevertheless he was already a great man his controversy with the abbe morlet on the subject of the east india company had brought him very much into notice and although his arguments in favour of that monopoly had not saved it from extinction they had caused his name to be in everybody's mouth his position as minister for the republic of geneva gave him the entry to the court of versailles and brought him into contact with illustrious personages who otherwise might have disdained a mere wealthy foreigner neither a noble or a catholic his well-filled purse completed his popularity for it was not seldom at the service of abject place-hunters and needy literati moreover he had been fortunate in his choice of a wife by the time that the king of poland's bonne maman wrote that little note to madame necker the wife of the genevese banker had founded a salon as brilliant and crowded as madame geoffrin's own she had achieved this in a few years whereas madame geoffrin for the same task and in spite of her wealth and generosity had required a quarter of a century but madame necker besides being young rich and handsome was bitten with the prevailing craze for literature could listen unweariedly for hours to the most laboured portraits and eloges and although herself the purest and most austere of women would open her salon to any reprobate provided only he was witty madame necker first known to us as suzanne courchot was the daughter of a swiss pastor and saw the light in the presbytery of crassier in the pays de vaux the simple white house with its green shutters is still to be seen separated from the road by a little garden planted with fruit trees the courchot were an ancient and respectable family whom madame necker it was one of her weaknesses would fain have proved entitled to patents of nobility some courchot or courchaudy are found mentioned in old chronicles as fighting beneath the banners of savoy and it was from these that madame necker sought vainly to trace her descent she held a secret consultation for this cherished object with the sieur Chirin, genealogist to the king but his decision disappointed her chagrined but not convinced for her opinions were not easily shaken she carried home the precious papers and locked them up without erasing the endorsement titre de noblesse de la famille courchot which she had written with her own hand 
Monsieur Courchot took pains to give his only daughter an unusually thorough and liberal education. She knew Latin and a little Greek, swept with extreme flounce the circle of the sciences, and was accomplished enough in every way to attract the admiration, very often even the love, of sundry grave and learned personages. Mixed with her severe charm there must have been some coquetry, for at a very early age she began making conquests among the young ministers who arrived on Sundays at Crassier, ostensibly to assist M. Couchot in his duties, and a voluminous correspondence, somewhat high-flown as was the fashion of the day, is extant to prove that Suzanne possessed the art of keeping her numerous admirers simultaneously well in hand. Verses, occasionally slightly Voltairean in tone, were also addressed to her, and later in life Madame Necker reproached herself for her placid acceptance of the homage thus expressed, and owned that had she understood it better she would have liked it less. Suzanne's parents, proud no doubt of their daughter's talents and accomplishments, took her after a while to Lausanne. That pleasant city, since giving up its own political ideals and falling under the sway of Bern, had lapsed into easy-going intellectual ways and even professed a discreet and modified form of Voltairianism. Ever since the author of the Henriade had dazzled it with his presence, it had been on the lookout for illustrious personalities and welcomed all foreigners who showed any promise of literary distinction. What with her pretensions to be a bel esprit, her youth and beauty, Mademoiselle Couchot captivated the town at once, and very soon had the proud joy of founding an Académie de la Poudrière, and being elected to preside over it under the fantastic name of Temir. The members of this intellectual society were of both sexes and all young. Their duties consisted in writing portraits of one another and essays or odes on subjects in general. Combined with these profound pursuits, there seems to have been a good deal of flirtation, and doubtless both the scholasticism and the sentiment were equally to Suzanne Courchot's taste. During her stay in Lausanne, she fascinated Gibbon, and for the first time in her career of conquest, fell in love herself. So profound was her passion, or so profound in her own self-tormenting way did she imagine it to be, that she remained constant to her engagement during the four years of Gibbon's absence in England, and wrote him agitated, abject letters of reproach, when he, alleging his father's invincible objections, broke off the engagement. Her devoted friend Moulton, who appears to have loved her all his life, was so touched by her despair that with Suzanne's own consent he sought the mediation of Rousseau in order to bring the recreant lover back to his allegiance. But the attempt was vain. Gibbon showed himself as heartless as Mademoiselle Courchot had proved indulgent, and when the lady as a last resource proposed that they should at least remain friends, he declined the amiable offer as being dangerous for both. Nevertheless, when they met again in Paris some years later, Mademoiselle Couchot, then married, welcomed Gibbon with kindness, and even wrote him notes containing, here and there, allusions to the past. For the age was evidently sentimental, and to cherish memories of vanished joys and make passing pathetic reference to them was a luxury of which Madame Necker would have been the last to deprive herself. On the death of her parents, Suzanne found herself obliged to seek for a situation as governess or companion. All her life, fortunate in making and keeping the most devoted friends, she found plenty anxious to help her in carrying out her plans. Among her sincerest admirers was the charming Duchesse d'Anville, whose sweetness, grace, and naive enthusiasm for Switzerland as a kind of romantic republic, all shepherds and shepherdesses, toy chalet, natural sentiments, and stage liberty, were so characteristic of the age and so admirably celebrated in Bonstetten's letters, 
it was in all probability through her introduction at geneva that suzanne became acquainted with madame de vermenu a rich parisian widow who fell immediately under the young orphan's charm and engaging her as a companion took her back to paris in that intellectual centre the promised land of all her thoughts suzanne speedily came into contact with several interesting people among others the delightful bunstetten then still young in years destined to be always young in heart and whom in the course of this work we shall often see among the band of fervent admirers surrounding madame de stal another frequent visitor at madame de vermenu's house was m necker at that time a partner in telusin's bank and already possessed of ample means he was a rejected suitor of the hostess but continued on very good terms with her and perhaps was expected to propose a second time if such were the widow's ideas they were doomed to disappointment for very soon after necker's introduction to suzanne he made a transfer of his affections to her he left however for geneva without declaring his sentiments and mademoiselle courchot once again in love and once again in despair poured out her feelings in a long letter to moulton that ever faithful friend it is best to bring things to a happy termination by taking care that m necker during his sojourn in geneva should hear nothing but praise of suzanne the device if needed was most successful for the banker returned to paris with his mind made up he proposed without loss of time and it is perhaps not too much to say that mademoiselle courchot jumped into his arms all the friends of the bride-elect were delighted and even madame de verminu proclaimed her pleasure at the turn which affairs had taken some little subsequent coolness however she must have manifested for the date fixed for the wedding was kept a secret from her when the day dawned suzanne stole out quietly and met m necker at the church door in what form the news was broken to the widow is not known but any annoyance she may have felt was not of long duration for in after years we find madame de vermenu a frequent guest at the necker and a little daughter born on the twenty second of april seventeen sixty six was named germaine after her End of section one section two of madame de stal by bella duffy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two germaine when germaine was about six years old m necker retired from the bank and devoted himself to the study of administrative questions this was in preparation for the career to which he felt himself called for years past his wealth had come frequently to the aid of a spendthrift government and an exhausted exchequer it was natural that he should seek his reward in power in his eloge de colbert published in seventeen seventy three he was at no pains to conceal that he was thinking of himself when drawing the portrait of an ideal minister of finance and some annoyance at turgot's appointment is thought to have added force to his attacks on the latter's theory concerning free trade in corn madame necker profiting from her husband's growing importance quickly attained the summit of her ambition in becoming the presiding genius of a salon thronged with intellectual celebrities buffon and thomas were her most trusted friends but austere though she was she did not disdain to admit to a certain intimacy men like marmontel the abbe galliani saint lambert and diderot they all flattered her outrageously to her face while some of them marmontel especially sneered at her behind her back all made love to her and misled by the studied warmth of pompous eloquence with which she proclaimed her delight in their society they not rarely persuaded themselves that they had added her to the list of their conquests and were chagrined 
and not a little disgusted later to discover that the only man she cared for was her husband. Indeed, she bored everybody with praise of Monsieur Necker, composing and reading aloud in her own salon a preposterous portrait of him, in which she compared him to most things in heaven and earth and the waters under the earth, from an angel to a polypus. Her rigidity, her self-consciousness, her want of charm, and the absence of humor were a fruitful theme of ridicule to the witty and heartless parasites who crowded her drawing-rooms and made raids on her husband's purse. And yet such was the native force of goodness in her that sooner or later, in every instance, detraction turned to praise. The bitter Madame de Genly, who detested the Necker and ridiculed them unsparingly, admits that the wife was a model of virtue, and Diderot paid her the greatest compliment which she perhaps ever received, when declaring that had he known her sooner, much that he had written would never have seen the light. Grimm was another frequenter of the Necker Salon, and the mistress of the house, being no less prodigal of gracious encouragement toward him than toward everybody else, he also eventually declared his sentiments of friendship and admiration with as much warmth as his manners allowed of. Like Voltaire, he called her Hypatie, and testified the genuineness of his regard by scolding her about her religious opinions. Needless to say, these were not infidel, but they were, in Grimm's opinion, disastrously illogical, and his fine taste in such matters being offended, he expressed his displeasure on one occasion in no measured terms. Madame Necker retorted, for she loved a discussion too fervently ever to be meek, but apparently Grimm was too much for her. Either his arguments were irrefragable, or his manner was irritating. The result was that Madame Necker, to the polite consternation of her numerous guests, dissolved into tears. Humiliated on reflection at having made such a scene, with characteristic ardor she seized the opportunity to write Grimm a high-flown apology, and an interchange of letters followed, in which the philosopher compared the lady to Venus, completed by Minerva, and Madame Necker ransacked the universe for metaphors wherewith to express her admiration of the gentleman's sensibility. As the Necker spent their summer at Saint-Ouen, not the historic chateau associated with Louis the Eighteenth, but another in the neighborhood and of the same name, the proximity to Paris enabled them to continue unbroken their series of dinners, suppers, and receptions twice a week. Many of the guests were notable personages, and most of them types which vanished forever a few years later, engulfed by the storm wave of the revolution. There was the Abbe Morlet, clear-headed, gravely ironical, with as much tact in concealing as in displaying the range of his knowledge and the depth of his insight. Saint Lambert, a little cold but full of exquisite politeness, supremely elegant in expression, and without being lively himself, possessed of the delicate art of never quenching liveliness in others. D'Alembert, charming if frigid, and destined soon to be an object of sentimental interest because of his inconsolable grief for Mademoiselle Lespinasse, the Abbe Reynal, doubtless enchanted to pour into Madame Necker's respectful ears the floods of eloquence for which Frederick the Great laughed at him. These, with Marmontel and Thomas, were almost always present. A few years earlier, the Abbe Galliani, delightful and incorrigible, would also have been seen. This extraordinary little man, political economist, archaeologist, mineralogist, diplomatist, and pulcinello, was one of Madame Necker's professed adorers. Everybody liked and admired him. Diderot described him as a treasure on a rainy day, Marmontel as the prettiest little harlequin with the head of Machiavelli, while for Madame Geoffrin 
he was her petite chose. After so much praise and from such people, Madame Necker must certainly have accepted him unconditionally, but it would be interesting to know exactly with what air she listened to his impassioned declarations. When eventually restored to his native land, or, as he expressed it, exiled from Paris, he wrote her impudent and characteristic epistles, in which reproaches at her virtue, intimate interrogations regarding her health, and envy of M. Necker's happiness, mingled with inquiries after everybody in his beloved capital, and wails of inconsolable grief at his own departure. Quel désert que cinquante mille Napolitains, he exclaims. Madame du Defont was also for a time an intimate guest at the Necker. The friendship did not last long. The Marquise, by this time infinitely weary of men and things, appears soon to have tired of Madame Necker's declamations of Monsieur Necker's superiority. Her final judgment on the wife was very severe, rather ill-tempered, and therefore unjust. Madame Necker was, she says, stiff and frigid, full of self-consciousness, but an upright woman. Her liking for the husband held out longer, but finally succumbed to the discovery that, while very intelligent, he failed to elicit wit from others. One felt oneself more stupid in his company than when with other people or alone. There is no trace of any variation in the friendship between Madame Necker and Madame Geoffrin. Perhaps the latter, with her habitual, gentle, voilà qui est bien, called her young friend to order, and early repressed the emphatic praises which could not but have wearied her. We are told that she hated exaggeration in everything, and how could Madame Necker's heavy flattery have found favor in her eyes? Her delicate savoir-vivre, too, that preternatural subtle sense which supplied the place in her of brilliancy and learning and early education, must have been vexed by Madame Necker's innocent but everlasting pedantry. We can fancy, however, that she managed in her imperceptible noiseless way to elude all these disturbing manifestations, and then she was doubtless pleased at Madame Necker's good-humoured patience with her scoldings. All Madame Geoffrin's friends, as we know, had to submit to be scolded, but probably few showed under the infliction the magnanimity of Madame Necker, who must have possessed all the power of submission peculiar to self-questioning souls. The calm old lady ensconced in her own peculiar chair, whether in Paris or at saint Ouen, in the midst of sparkling society, to which she had perseveringly fought her way, was disturbed in her serenity by no presage of misfortune. In point of reputation, the most illustrious, and in point of romantic ardor, the most fervent of all Madame Necker's friends was Buffon. He wrote her some eighty letters, full of fervid flattery and genuine, almost passionate affection, to which she responded in the terms of adulation that the old man still held dear. Such incense had once been offered to him in nauseating abundance. Now that he was old and lonely, it had diminished, and this fact, joined to his unquestionable admiration for Madame Necker, made him all the more easily intoxicated by her praise. Mixed with her high esteem for his genius was a womanly compassion for his bodily sufferings, that rendered the tie uniting their two minds a very sweet and charming one. On hearing that his end was near, she hastened to Montbard, where he was residing, and established herself by his bedside, remaining there five days, and courageously soothing the paroxysms of pain that had tortured her own sensitive nature to see. Perhaps her strong and unconcealed desire that the philosopher should make a Christian end lent her fortitude to continue the self-imposed task. There is no proof that she directly influenced him in that final declaration of faith by which he scandalized a free-thinking community, but she had often discussed religious questions with him, 
and deplored his want of a definite creed consequently it is possible that her mere presence may have had some effect upon him at the last on the brink of the irrevocable even the pride of controversy may come to be a little thing and buffon's wearied spirit perhaps recoiled from further speculation on the eternal problem of futurity and to be at one in that supreme moment with the pitying woman who had come to solace his final agony may have weighed with him above the praise and blame over which the grave was to triumph for ever madame necker delighted in making herself miserable and the melancholia natural to him probably caused thomas to be the most thoroughly congenial to her of all her friends the author of the petreide and the foe of the encyclopedists he enjoyed during his life a celebrity which posterity has not confirmed he was the originator of the unhappy style of writing in which madame necker so delighted that she modelled her own upon it for the rest he was a man of extremely austere and simple life as well of very honest character passion was unknown to him unless indeed the profound and sentimental esteem which he felt for madame necker was of a nature under more favourable treatment to have developed into love if so she found the way in his case as in all to restrain his feelings within platonic bounds and indulged him chiefly with affecting promises not to forget him when she should be translated to heaven madame necker may be said to have touched the zenith of social distinction the day on which the marechal de luxembourg entered her salon this charming old lady and exquisite grande dame the arbiter of politeness and fine manners was felicitously and untranslatably described by madame du defont in one delightful phrase as chat rose upon all those who met her at this period when she was already nearly seventy she seems to have produced the same impression of softness and elegance of fine malice and caressing irresistible ways madame de souza that sweet little woman round whose name the perfume of her own roses still seems to cling drew a portrait of the marechal in her novel eugenie de rotelin under the name of marechal de toute vie nor did she as sainte beuve tells us forget to introduce by way of contrast in the person of madame de Rienny, the pretty and winning duchesse de lausanne grand-niece of the marechal and another flower of madame necker's salon this little duchess joli petit oiseau a l'air et farouché to quote madame du defont once again was so devoted an admirer of m necker that hearing somebody in the tuileries garden blame him she slapped the speaker's face apart from this one outburst which saves her from seeming too meek she flits shadowy sweet and pathetic across the pages of her contemporaries the record of her life as we know it is brief and touching she kept herself unspotted from a most depraved world loved a very unworthy husband and died during the terror on the scaffold another friend and apparently a very sincere one of madame necker was madame Dudto. madame necker seems to have accepted that interesting woman just as she was including her relations with saint lambert whom the letters exchanged between the two ladies mention quite naturally the affection which she felt for the mother was extended by madame duto to the little daughter and there are letters of hers extant describing visits which she had paid to germaine while madame necker was at spa or at mont doré for her health they were written to relieve the natural pain of absence on the parent's part and are full of praises of the child of her engaging ways her air of health and her magnificent eyes end of section two section three of madame de stal by bella duffy 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Three Girlhood and Marriage. In the brilliant world in which she awoke, Germaine very soon found her place. It is a very familiar little picture, that which we have of her, seated on a low stool beside her mother at the receptions, and fixing on one speaker after another her great astonished eyes. Soon, very soon, she began to join in the conversation herself, and by the time she was ten or eleven years old, she had grown into a person whose opinion was quite seriously consulted. Some of the friends of the house, Marmontel, Reynal, and others, enchanted to have a new shrine in the same temple at which to worship, talked to her, wrote verses to her, and laid at her young feet some of the homage up to then exclusively devoted to Madame Necker. That lady began by being enchanted at Germaine's amazing powers and set to work to educate her with characteristic thoroughness and pedantry. Everything that was strongest in her, family pride, the sense of maternal authority, the love of personal influence, the passion for training, seemed to find their opportunity in the surprising daughter whom heaven had given her. She drove the child to study with unrelenting ardor, teaching her things beyond her age, and encouraging her at the same time further to exercise her intelligence by listening to conversations on all sorts of subjects. The consequence was that at eleven Germaine's conversational powers were already stupendous. On being introduced to a child of her own age, a little Mademoiselle Hubert, who was her cousin, she amazed her new acquaintance by the questions she put to her. She asked what were her favorite lessons, if she knew any foreign languages, if she often went to the theater. The little cousin, confessing to having profited but rarely by such an amusement, Germaine was horror-stricken, but promised that henceforward the deficiency should be remedied, adding that on their return from the theater they should both proceed to write down the subject of the pieces performed with suitable reflections, that being, she said, her own habit. In the evening of this first day's acquaintance, Mademoiselle Hubert, already sufficiently awestruck, one must think, was further a witness to the attention paid to Germaine by her mother's most distinguished guests. Everybody addressed her with a compliment or pleasantry. She answered everything with ease and grace. The cleverest men were those who took most pleasure in making her talk, they asked what she was reading, recommended new books to her, and talked to her of what she knew or of what she had yet to learn. From her tenderest years, Germaine wrote portraits and éloges. At fifteen she made extracts from the Esprit de Loi with annotations, and about the same time the Abbé Renal was very anxious that she should contribute to his great work an article on the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. But before this, when she was only twelve, the effects of such premature training had made themselves visible. Her feelings had been as unnaturally developed as her mind. Already that rich, abundant nature, so impetuous, generous, and fervid, which was at once the highest gift and deepest curse, had begun to reveal itself in an exaggerated sensibility. Praise of her parents moved her to tears, for the little cousin she had an affection amounting to passion, and the mere sight of celebrated people gave her palpitation of the heart. She did not care to be amused. What pleased her best was what pained her most, and her imagination was fed upon the Clarissa Harlow school of novels. By degrees, her health began to fail, and at fourteen the collapse was so complete as to cause the most serious alarm. Tronchon was consulted and prescribed absolute rest from study. This was a cruel blow to Madame Necker, a nature allowed to develop spontaneously, a mind virgin of the pruning hook, were objects of as much horror to her as if they had been forbidden by heaven. 
that her daughter just at the final moment when what was doubtless the mere preliminary course of study had been traversed should be released from bondage and abandoned to her own impetuosity was well-nigh insupportable she had no alternative but to resign herself and therefore silently and coldly as was her wont she accepted the situation nevertheless she was neither reconciled to it nor felt the same interest in germaine again years afterwards the bitterness that she had hoarded in her soul betrayed itself in one little phrase madame necker de sausanne was congratulating her on her daughter's astonishing powers she is nothing said madame necker coldly nothing to that which i would have made her dispatched from paris to the pure air of saint ouen and ordered to do nothing but enjoy herself the young girl quickly recovered her vivacity and developed a charming joyousness this new mood of hers while gradually estranging her from her mother drew her closer to her father m necker who detested literary women had looked with but scanty favour on his daughter's passion for writing and it is probable that as long as she was exclusively under madame necker's rule he did not feel for her more than the commonplace sort of affection which a busy and serious-minded father bestows on a little girl during her childhood germaine herself lavished all her warmest affection on her mother being apparently drawn to her by the subtle attraction which a very deep and reserved nature exercises on an excitable one madame necker pale subdued in manner restrained in gesture surrounded with respectful adorers revered by her husband and flattered by her friends seems to have filled her observant imaginative little daughter with a feeling bordering on awe very sensitive yet very submissive and quite incapable of resentment germaine threw herself with characteristic passionate ardour into the task of winning her mother's praise how complacently madame necker must have accepted the homage implied in these efforts it is easy to imagine a little contempt for the child's impetuosity helped to give her the firmness necessary for moulding according to her own notions the nature so plastic yet so vital thus placed within her grasp a good nay a noble woman yet essentially a self-righteous one she could comprehend perfection in nothing that did not to a certain degree resemble herself her ideas her principles her will were she conceived to shape and fashion and restrain and recreate this thing of fire and intellect this creature all spirit instinct and insight that she named her child germaine predestined all her life to struggle to consume herself to ashes like the arabian princess who fought with the jinn succumbed for the time to her mother's will by the annihilation of everything that was inalienably herself the spell lasted as long as the tyranny which had created it but once freed from the thraldom wandering with her young cousin through the avenues of saint ouen drinking in the freshness of the shadowy glades and acting innocent little dramas germaine became more natural and in her mother's eyes more commonplace madame necker lost interest in her drew frigidly away from her and even began to feel some jealousy of the newborn affection between the father and child when germaine was fifteen m necker fell from power a few months previously he had published his compte rendu and roused the enthusiasm of france he had been the idol of the hour and his name was in everybody's mouth from all sides from nobles and bourgeois alike letters of praise and congratulation poured in upon him among these was an anonymous epistle written by germaine and immediately recognized by her father who knew the author's style she was transported with joy and triumph and probably understood her father's achievements better than two-thirds of the people who applauded them 
for she was endowed with a marvellous quickness and completeness of comprehension, and where she loved, her sympathy was flawless. She was always willing to welcome and adopt the thought of another, and never seemed to guess how much of force and brilliancy it owed to the illuminating power of her own vivid intellect. On M. Necker's retirement from the Ministry of Finance, he came to saint Ouen, followed in his retreat by the pity and praise of the best and brightest minds of France. His daughter, seeing more of him than ever now, in the greater leisure which he enjoyed, and regarding him as the heroic victim of an infamous political cabal, soon conceived for him an affection that amounted to idolatry. On his side he was enchanted with her humorous gaiety, and lent himself to her playfulness in the not rare moments when Germaine's small sum of years got the better of her large amount of intelligence. One day Madame Necker had been called from the dining-room during meal-time on some domestic or other business. Returning unexpectedly, she heard a great deal of noise, and opening the door stood transfixed with amazement on seeing her husband and daughter capering about with their table-napkins twisted round their heads like turbans. Both culprits looked rather ashamed of themselves when detected, and their spirits fell to zero beneath the lady's frozen glance. The Necker, in spite of the ex-minister's so-called disgrace, continued surrounded with friends, so that from fifteen to twenty, at which latter age he married, Germaine's days were one long intellectual triumph. Her portrait, read aloud to the guests, were eagerly received and enthusiastically applauded. She wrote one of her father in competition with her mother, but when M. Necker was appealed to on the respective merits of the two compositions, he wisely declined to pronounce any opinion. His daughter, however, divined his thoughts. He admires Mama's portrait, she said, but mine flatters him more. Her own merits inspired the wits surrounding her in their turn. A portrait by Guibert described her as a priestess of Apollo, with dark eyes illumined by genius, black floating curls, and marked features expressive of a destiny superior to that of most women. This was an ornamental way of saying that Germaine was not beautiful. She was, in fact, very plain, strangely so considering that she had magnificent eyes, fine shoulders and arms, and abundant hair. What spoiled her was the total want of grace. When talking, she was much too prodigal of grimace and gesture, and if eloquent and convincing, was also overpowering. She felt too much on every subject, and carried other people's small stream of platitudes along in the rushing tide of her own emotions, till her hearers, were left exhausted and admiring, but also a little resentful. She disconcerted the very persons whom she most revered, by only pausing long enough in her talk to grasp their meaning and feed her own thought with it, till that glowed more consumingly than ever, while all the time what she felt, what they felt, and what she imagined that they meant to say was proclaimed in loud, harsh accents, most trying to sensitive nerves. At this time she was busily writing, and her father, who nicknamed her Mademoiselle de saint Écritoire, could not correct the tendency even by his unceasing gentle raillery. In a comedy entitled Sophie ou les sentiments secrets, she scandalized Madame Necker by selecting for a subject the struggles of a young orphan against the passion inspired in her by her guardian, a married man. To this period belonged also Jane Grey and Montmorency, both tragedies and various novelettes. When Germaine was nearing twenty, the weighty question of her marriage came under discussion, and serious consideration was then for the first time accorded to a suitor whom her large fortune had long attracted. This was the Baron de Stahl Holstein, secretary to the Swedish embassy. He seems to have been one of the elegant and amiable diplomatists whom the courts of Europe in those days turned out by the score. He had wit and good manners, 
as he had also the golden key of the court chamberlain, otherwise his personality was insignificant in the extreme. He was fortunate, however, in serving under a very popular ambassador, the Count de Creutz, and in representing a king who, both for political and personal reasons, was anxious to keep on good terms with France. Gustavus III of Sweden adored Paris and was in continual correspondence with Madame de la Marque, Madame d'Egmont, Madame de Boufflet, and anybody who would keep him conversant with the gossip of the Tuileries and Versailles. The Count de Creutz, having the intention of shortly retiring, it was understood that the Baron de Stahl Holstein was to be his successor. That gentleman, who comprehended his own interests and was head over ears in debt, lost no opportunity of persuading the Swedish king's trio of witty correspondents, who in their turn were careful to impress on Gustavus, as well as on Louis the Sixteenth and his queen, that the next Swedish ambassador must be endowed with a splendid fortune. A grand marriage was, of course, to be the means of achieving this, and Mademoiselle Germaine Necker, an heiress and a Protestant, was fixed upon for the bride. The delicate negotiations lasted for some considerable time, during which period the prize the baron sought was disputed by two formidable rivals, William Pitt and Prince George Augustus of Mecklenburg, brother of the reigning duke. Madame Necker warmly supported Pitt's suit and showed great displeasure at being unable to overcome her daughter's obstinate aversion to it. Seeing how distinguished the Englishman already was, and how brilliant his future career promised to be, one wonders a little at Germaine's rejection of him. Probably the secret of her determination lay in the passionate adoration which she had now begun to feel for her father, on whom, as all his friends and partisans assured her, the eyes of misery-stricken France were fixed as on a saviour. The idea of quitting France in such a crisis, at the dawn, so to speak, of her father's apotheosis, would naturally be intensely repugnant to her, and possibly for that very reason Madame Necker, always a little jealous of the sympathy between her husband and her daughter, warmly advocated Pitt's claims. A painful coldness ensued between mother and daughter and lasted until the former happened to fall dangerously ill. Then Germaine's feelings underwent a revulsion of passionate tenderness, and in the touching reconciliation which ensued between parent and child, Mr. Pitt and his suit were forgotten. Prince George Augustus of Mecklenburg was even less fortunate being refused by both Monsieur and Madame Necker, with a promptitude which he fully deserved. For he had nothing to recommend him but his conspicuous position, and had very imprudently avowed that he sought Mademoiselle Necker's hand only for the sake of her enormous dower. The ground being thus cleared for Madame de Boufflet's protégé, that energetic lady set to work to obtain from Gustavus a promise not to remove the baron, now ambassador, from France for a specified long term of years. This assurance that they would not be parted from their daughter, having been given to the Necker, and formally embodied in a clause of the marriage settlement, the document was signed by the king and queen of France, and several other illustrious personages, and the wedding celebrated on the 14th of January, 1776. The first few days after her marriage, Madame de Stal, according to the custom of the time, passed under her father's roof, and among her letters is a sweet and affectionate one, which she addressed to her mother on the last day of her sojourn with her parents. Perhaps I have not always acted rightly towards you, mamma, she writes. At this moment, as in that of death, all my deeds are present to my mind, and I fear that I may not leave in you the regret that I desire. But deign to believe that the phantoms of imagination have often fascinated my eyes, and often come between you and me, so as to render me unrecognizable. But the very depth of my tenderness makes me feel at this moment 
that it has always been the same. It is part of my life, and I am entirely shaken and unhinged in this hour of separation from you. Tonight I shall not have in my house the angel that guaranteed it from thunder and fire. I shall not have her who would protect me if I were dying, and would enfold me before God with the rays of her sublime soul. I shall not have at every moment news of your health. I foresee regrets at every instant. I pray that I may be worthy of you. Happiness may come later, at intervals, or never. The end of life terminates everything, and you are so sure that there is another life as to leave no doubt in my heart. Accept, Mamma, my dear Mamma, my profound respect and boundless tenderness. Perhaps when Madame Necker read this letter, she felt in part consoled for the real or fancied pain which her brilliant and unaccountable daughter had given her. In spite of passing dissensions with her mother, Germaine's twenty years of girlhood had been essentially happy, for they had been tenderly and watchfully sheltered from blight or harm. End of Section 3section four of madame de stal by bella duffy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four necker's short-lived triumph part one some spiteful ridicule awaited the young ambassadress on her first entrance into official life and strangely enough among these detractors was madame de boufflet herself who wrote to gustavus the third she has been virtuously brought up but has no knowledge of the world or its usages and has a degree of assurance that i never saw equalled at her age or in any position if she were less spoilt by the incense offered up to her i should have tried to give her a little advice another courtier soul was vexed because madame de stal when presented on her marriage tore her flounce and thus spoiled her third curtsy. As much scandal was caused by this gaucherie as if it had been some newly invented sin. But the delinquent herself, when the heinousness of her conduct was communicated to her, simply laughed. She could indeed afford to despise all such censure, for if too obstreperously intellectual and ardent for artificial circles, she soon attained to immense influence among all thinking and quasi-thinking minds of France. Politics were now beginning to be the one absorbing subject whose paramount importance dwarfed at every other, and Madame de Stal, always in the vanguard of ideas, threw herself with characteristic enthusiasm into the questions of the day. To talk about the glorious future of humanity was the fashionable cant of the hour, but Madame de Stal really believed in the regeneration about which others affectedly maundered, and at all social gatherings in the Rue Bergère or at saint Ouen, where her presence was as frequent as of yore, she held forth on this subject to the crowd of dazzled listeners, whom she partially convinced and wholly overpowered she had been married but little more than a year when the first shadow of coming events dimmed the lustre of her new existence in a speech pronounced at the assembly of notables in april seventeen eighty seven monsieur de calonne impugned the accuracy of the famous compte rendu monsieur necker indignantly demanded from the king the permission to hold a public debate on the subject in the presence of the assembly before which he had been accused louis the sixteenth refused and m necker then immediately published a memoir of self-justification the result was a lettre de cachet which exiled him to within forty leagues of paris the order conveyed by lenoir the minister of police reached m necker in the evening when he was sitting in his wife's salon surrounded by his daughter and some friends. The liveliness of Madame de Stal's indignation may be imagined. 
she has described it herself in her consideration sur la revolution francaise and declared that the king's decision appeared to her an unexampled act of despotism its parallel would not have been far to seek and acts a thousand times worse disgrace every page of the annals of france but madame de stael always incapable of judging where the pure and noble interests of her father were concerned can be pardoned for her exaggeration in this instance as she had half france to share it all paris she says came to visit m necker in the twenty-four hours that preceded his departure even the archbishop of toulouse already practically designated for m de calonne's successor was not afraid to make his bow offers of shelter poured in upon m necker and the best chateaux in france were placed at his disposal he finally elected the chateau de marolles near fontainebleau although not as he naively confesses in a letter to his daughter without some secret misgivings as to the decided taste in all good things and bad of dear mamma thither madame de stal hastened to join him and to console by her unfailing sympathy her constant applause and inexhaustible admiration a misfortune which after all had been singularly mitigated m necker accepted all this homage as his due and his magnanimous wish that the archbishop of toulouse might serve the state and king better than he would have done is recorded by his daughter with the unction of a true devotee there is something adorably simple and genuine in all her utterances about this time in a letter to her husband who apparently never objected to play second fiddle to monsieur and madame necker she directs him exactly how to behave at court so as to bring home with dignity yet force to their majesties the wickedness of their conduct towards so great and good a man and she adds that but for her position as ambassadress she would never again set foot within the precincts of versailles this she wrote even after the lettre de cachet was cancelled a few months later a reparation was offered to her father with which even his own sense of his worth and the idolatry of his family should have been satisfied for he was recalled to power unwillingly recalled it is true the king's hand was forced his present sentiments to m necker if not hostile were cold while those of the queen had changed to aversion but the marquis de mirabeau had defined the position of france as a game of blind man's buff which must lead to a general upset consternation had invaded even the densest intelligences and the voice of the public clamoured for its saviour this time again the title given to m necker was director-general of finance but on the other hand the coveted entry into the royal council was accorded him it was the first instance since the days of sully of such an honour being granted to a protestant it was given at a moment when the suggestion to restore civil rights to those of alien faith had been bitterly resented by the french clergy and it was one of the many signs for those who had eyes to see that the last hour of the old regime had struck the nomination was hailed with a burst of applause from one end of france to the other madame de stal hurried to saint ouen with the news but she found her father the reverse of elated fifteen months previously the fifteen months wasted by the ineptitude of brienne he said he might have done something now it was too late madame de stal was far from sharing these feelings when anything had to be accomplished by her father she was of the opinion of calonne in his celebrated answer to marie antoinette si c'est possible c'est fait si c'est impossible sera se fera and undoubtedly m necker did his best on returning to power but in spite of his honesty good faith and unquestionable abilities he was not the man for the hour very likely as his friends and especially his daughter asserted no minister however gifted could have succeeded entirely in such a crisis 
and doubtless he was as far as any merely pure-minded man could be from deserving the storm of execration with which the court party eventually overwhelmed him we have said that he did his best his mistake was that he did his best for everybody in a moment when an unhesitating choice had become imperative he was divided between sympathy with the people and pity for the king he returned to power without any plan of his own but finding louis the sixteenth was pledged to assemble the states-general he insisted that the representation of the tiers etat should be doubled so as to balance the influence of the other two parties royalists affirm that this was a fatal error since from that hour the revolution became inevitable madame de stael jealous of her father's reputation maintains that reasonable concessions on the part of the court faction and the higher clergy would have nullified the danger of the double representation but the point was that such an aristocracy and such a clergy were by nature unteachable and every moment wasted in attempting to persuade them was an hour added to the long torture of oppressed and starving france the kind heart liberal instincts and administrative ability of necker taught him that without the double representation the voice of the people might be lifted in vain but the weakness of his character and the awe of his bourgeois soul for the time-honoured fetish of monarchy prevented his understanding that the power he invoked could never again be laid by any spell of his choosing by seeking to arrange this or that to pare off something here and add something there in a word by trying to be just all around when nobody cared for mutual justice but himself he rendered a divided allegiance to his country and his king if there were no conscious duplicity in his character there was abundance of it in his opinions and to say that nobody could have succeeded better is to beg the question in the face of the savage inflexible arrogance of the aristocrats and clergy there was but one course open to a really high-minded man and that was to leave the court to its own devices and throwing himself with all of earnestness and wisdom that he possessed into the popular cause to be guided by it and yet govern it by force of sympathy and will he might have failed in the light of later events it can even be said that he would have failed but such a failure would have been grander more vital for good and sterile for harm than the opprobrium which eventually visited the honest necker and pursued him to his grave End of section four. Section five of Madame de Stael by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter four Necker's Short Lived Triumph. Part two. Needless to say that opinions such as these never found their way into Madame de Stael's mind. On occasions, perhaps too frequently renewed, the portals of that enchanted palace were guarded by her heart in her view everything might yet be saved were necker only listened to and obeyed every day he will do something good and prevent something bad she wrote to the reactionary and angry gustavus and thus betrayed that preoccupation with the individual his virtues or his crimes which for all her intellect blinded her not rarely to the essential significance of things with breathless interest and varied feelings of sympathy and indignation she watched the great events which now followed in rapid succession her father was monarchical and believed that a representative monarchy on the english model was the true remedy for france madame de stael incapable of differing with so great a man endorsed this opinion at the time although eventually she became republican but nobody was republican then that is in name people had not yet realized to what logical conclusions their opinions would carry them madame de stael hating oppression blamed the sightless obstinacy of the nobles 
but on the other hand was but little moved by the famous sermon du jeu de pomme she deplored the rejection of necker's plan that happy medium which was to settle everything and stigmatized as it deserved the imbecility of the court party as illustrated by confidence in foreign regiments and the declaration of the twenty third of june always optimist and confident of the inevitable triumph of right over might she clung to the belief that a thoroughly pure character in such a crisis was the one indispensable element of success the mysterious nature of c a s repelled her she preferred the virtuous malouet to the titanic mirabeau and was almost as blind as her father to the enormous electric force of the tribune's undisciplined genius for if often prejudiced she rarely was morbid and false ideas did not dazzle her no splendour of achievement unaccompanied by loftiness of principle could win her applause but she failed to grasp the fact that perfection of moral character by its very scruples and hesitations is necessarily handicapped in any race with the velocity of public events no man can bring his entire self very rarely can he even bring all that is best of himself into a struggle with warring forces and contradictory individualities in such a contest swiftness of insight power of expression and force of organic impulse are the only factors of value in supreme moments of action men are greater than themselves made so by the sudden unconscious contraction of their complex personality into one flame point of consuming will all this madame de stal seems never to have felt if she loved unworthy people and how many she did love it was because she deceived herself regarding them as all her life she deceived herself about her father she was intolerant of any triumph but that of virtue and was thus rendered unjust to the great deeds of men who imperfect and erring themselves can sympathize with the aspirations of the human heart because its baseness is not unknown to them on the eleventh of july at three o'clock in the afternoon m necker who had become a sort of cassandra to the court party and was detested in proportion received a letter from the king ordering him to quit paris and france and to accomplish the departure with the utmost secrecy and dispatch he was at table with some guests when this order was handed to him he read it put it into his pocket and continued his conversation as though nothing had happened dinner over he took madame necker aside and informed her what had occurred nothing was communicated to madame de stal probably her father thought she would be too much excited monsieur and madame necker hastily ordered their carriage and without bidding anybody farewell without even delaying to change their clothes they had themselves conveyed to the nearest station for post-horses thence they continued their journey uninterruptedly fleeing like culprits from the people whose indignation was feared by the king madame de stal is lost in admiration of this single-minded conduct of her father and lays a special stress on the fact that even during the journey he made no effort to win for himself the suffrages of the multitude where is another man she naively asks who would not have had himself brought back in his own despite certainly an ambitious man might have adopted this theatrical plan but it is much more likely under the actual circumstances that an ambitious man would never have left at all m necker had only to announce his disgrace to the people of paris and go over once for all to the popular side to have received an intoxicating ovation as it was the news of his dismissal cast the capital into consternation all the theatres were closed medals were struck in the fallen minister's honour and the first cockade worn was green the colour of his liveries what a career might then have been his 
if instead of being an obedient subject he had chosen to be a leader. Madame de Stael thought that it was to the last degree noble and disinterested of him to vanish from the sight of an adoring multitude rather than bring fresh difficulties on the master who had deserted him. But the destinies of a nation are of higher value than the comfort of a monarch, and there are certain responsibilities which no man who does not feel himself incapable, and that was not Necker's case, is justified in declining. To throw back the love and influence offered him then, for the last time, by France, to sympathize with the popular cause and yet to abandon it, and to do all this out of obedience to the senseless caprice of a faction and the arbitrary command of a king, was to behave like a court chamberlain, but in no sense like a statesman. The taking of the Bastille and the king's declaration at the Hôtel de Ville followed immediately on Necker's retirement. Madame de Stael records these events in a very few words, and shows herself, at the moment and henceforward, through all the opening scenes of the revolution, more alive to the humiliation and dismay of the royal family than to the apocalyptic grandeur of the catastrophe. The acts committed as one reads of them quietly now are revolting in their mingled grotesqueness and terror. To those who witnessed them, they sickened where they did not deprave. The livid head of Foulon on the pike, the greasy, filthy, partly drunken populace, who rose as from the depths of the earth to invade the splendid privacy of royal Versailles, the degraded women dragged from shameful obscurity and paraded in the lurid glare of an indecent triumph, Madame de Lamballe's monstrous and dishonoured death, Marat's hellish accusations, and Robespierre's diseased suspicions were things that must have destroyed in those who lived through them all capacity for admiration. The fact that Madame de Stal did not lose heart altogether remains an abiding witness to her faith and courage. She was wounded in her tenderest part by the court's ingratitude and the assembly's indifference toward her father. Every natural and cultivated sentiment in her was wounded by what she saw. Unlike Madame Roland, she had no traditions and no past of her own to attach her, in spite of everything, to the people. She was insensible to the merely physical infection of enthusiasm, and never even for a moment possessed by the vertigo of the revolutionary demon dance. She remained from first to last an absolute stranger to every act and every consideration that was not either manifest to her intellect or strong an appeal to her heart, and yet such was her force of mind and rectitude of insight that under the directory we shall find her no less interested in public events than under the monarchy. The grief that Madame de Stal undoubtedly experienced at her father's banishment was not destined to be of long duration. He had hardly reached the Hôtel des Trois Rois at Bâle when, to his great astonishment, Madame de Polignac asked to speak to him. She was the last person that he expected to see there, but surprise at her presence was soon swallowed up in the far greater amazement excited by all she had to tell. The taking of the Bastille, the massacre of Foulon and Berthier and de Launay, the critical position of de Besenval and the stampede of the aristocrats, what a catalogue of events! He had never, his daughter says, admitted the possibility of proscriptions, and he was a long while before he could understand the motives which had induced Madame de Polignac to depart. He had not much time to reflect on all he had heard before letters from the king and from the assembly arrived, urging him to return. He did so most unwillingly, according to Madame de Stal, for the murders committed on the 14th of July although few in number affrighted him, and he believed no longer in the success of a cause now blood-stained. 
he seems to have abandoned all sympathy with the people from this moment and to have returned avowedly with no intention than that of using his popularity as a buckler with which to defend the royal authority madame de stael informed by letters from her father of his departure from france and ultimate destination which was germany had hastened after him with her husband and overtook him first at brussels there the party had separated momentarily m necker hurriedly forward with the baron de stael and madame necker who was suffering in health following by slower stages with her daughter the consequence was that madame de stael arrived at Bâle after her father's interview with madame de polignac and almost at the same time as he received the order to return in this way she had the profound joy of witnessing the enthusiasm which greeted him on every step of his way no such ovation she truly says had ever before been bestowed upon an uncrowned head women fell on their knees as the carriage passed the leading citizens of the towns where it stopped took the places of the postilions and the populace finally substituted themselves for the horses they met numbers of aristocratic fugitives on the journey and m necker at their request showered on them autograph letters to serve as passports and enable them to cross the frontiers in safety whenever the carriage stopped the popular idol harangued the crowd and impressed on them the necessity of respecting persons and property he entreated of them as they professed so much love for him to give him the most striking proof that they could of it by always doing their duty madame de stael says that her father was fully aware of the fleeting nature of popularity and under these circumstances one wonders that he took the trouble in such a crisis to make so many speeches but it is probable that the intoxication of praise was a little too much for him and he had at all times the sacerdotal tendency to preach at ten leagues from paris news was brought to the travellers that de besenval had been arrested by order of the commune and was to be taken to the capital where he would said the pessimists be infallibly torn to pieces by the populace m necker entreated to intervene took upon himself to rescind the order of the commune and promised to obtain the sanction of the authorities to his act on arriving in paris consequently his first care was to proceed in company with his family to the hotel de ville the streets the roofs the windows of every house were densely thronged cries of vive necker rent the air as the redeemer of the country appeared on a balcony and began his discourse he demanded the amnesty of de besenval and of all those who shared de besenval's opinion this extensive programme committed all those who accepted it to a reactionary policy since to pardon the people's enemies unconditionally was to condone and in a measure to sanction their crimes but no such considerations presented themselves at that moment to impair necker's triumph the popular enthusiasm accorded him what he asked fresh thunders of applause broke forth and madame de stal overcome with emotion fainted end of section five Section six of Madame de Stal by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter five. Madame de Stal is courageous for her friends. Part one. Necker's victory over the rage of the populace was a fleeting one. He had indeed overstepped the prerogatives of a minister in asking for the amnesty misled by the elation of his gratified vanity and the impulse of his benevolent heart he an ardent defender of order forgot that in placing himself between the assembly and king on the one hand and the people on the other he practically recognized the right of a faction to act without the consent of the government it was for the latter to reverse the decree of the commune and not for the electors of paris 
his dream of smiling peace installed by his hand on the ruins of the revolution was rudely and rapidly dispelled madame de stael sorrowfully records that on the very evening of that glorious day the amnesty was retracted and ascribes this result in great part to the influence of mirabeau but in truth a very little reflection must have sufficed to convince anybody that the utopian demands of necker were singularly misplaced the very electors who had acceded to them asserted that all they had ever intended was to shield the arrested royalists from the fury of the populace but in no sense from the action of justice the assembly confirmed this view and from that moment necker's influence was practically gone it was proved to be a bubble and his triumph respectable as were some of the motives which had urged him to invoke it became ludicrous when contrasted with the stern and tragic realities of the moment this madame de stal did not could not see she was fain to console herself with a compassionate reflection that after all de bizonval an old man was saved she narrates with dolorous pride the efforts honestly courageously and to a certain degree successfully made by her father during fifteen months to avert the disaster of famine and innocently appeals to them against the failure as a statesman to which she resolutely shuts her eyes one measure after another opposed by necker was voted the confiscation of the property of the clergy the suppression of titles of nobility and the omission of assignat no popularity could have resisted such successive blows and necker was popular no longer still madame de stal touchingly begs the world in her writings not to allow itself to be turned from the paths of virtue by the spectacle of a good man so persecuted by fate she claims our admiration for a series of quixotic acts and is perpetually insisting on the amazing magnanimity which would not allow her father to become base because he had ceased to be useful thoroughly discouraged at last perhaps partly convinced that to preach kindness to savages and self-abnegation to the vile was a task to be resumed in better times necker tendered his resignation and had the mortification of seeing it accepted with perfect indifference both by the assembly and the king before leaving paris forever he deposited in the royal treasury two millions of his own property the exact object of this munificence is not clear even madame de stal failed to explain it on any practical grounds but she admired it extremely and so may we the journey with the terrified and suffering madame necker to switzerland was a great contrast to the return in the previous year to paris then it had been roses roses all the way now it was nothing but insults at arcy sur aube the carriage was stopped by an infuriated crowd who accused m necker of having betrayed the cause of the people in the interests of the emigrant nobles the accusation was an absurd one since he had only endeavoured to be superhumanly kind to everybody he had wished to preserve the people from crimes and starvation the clergy from ruin and the emigrant nobles from detection and this was the result it was hard but inevitable and as there were many worse fates than m necker's in those days one cannot quite free oneself from a feeling of impatience at madame de stal's perpetual lamentations over the inconceivable hardships of her parents lot we now approach an episode in madame de stal's life which it is necessary to touch on with discretion this is her connection with the count louis de narbonne the stories circulated in regard to them are familiar to all readers of madame d'arblay's memoir 
dr burney thought himself in duty bound to warn his little fanny against her growing adoration for necker's great but according to him not blameless daughter who during her stay at mickleham exerted herself to win the friendship of the author of cecilia fanny as we know was at first greatly shocked and completely incredulous she described madame de stael as loving monsieur de narbonne tenderly but so openly and in a manner so devoid of coquetry that friendship between two men in her opinion could hardly be differently manifested but the seed of suspicion once cast in the little prude's mind quickly germinated and led eventually to a total cessation of her acquaintance with the woman whose brilliancy and goodness had so fascinated her this is not the place in which to discuss fanny's conduct but was the information on which she based it correct who shall say madame de stael was extremely imprudent and she seems to have been dangerously near to loving a number of men miss berry in her memoirs accuses her of a passion for talleyrand and spoke as though concluding it to be a theme of common gossip she certainly liked to absorb a good deal of her friend's affection and was avowedly displeased when they married her sentiments toward baron de stal full of a sweet and fresh cordiality at first seem rapidly to have changed to aversion as far as it is possible to judge she unhesitatingly sacrificed him on all occasions to her filial love or her intellectual aims when he was in paris she left him in order to console m necker in his mournful retirement at coppet when he was at coppet she remained in paris there to form and electrify a constitutional salon various anecdotes attest to the scandal uttered about her and the truth of some of these stories admits of little doubt but on the other hand it must be remembered that detraction is ever busiest with the greatest names that madame de stal always preoccupied with her subject and never with herself irritated the nerves and stirred the bile of inferior people who were proportionately gratified to hear her attacked and that she lived in the midst of a society where conjugal fidelity was rare enough to be hardly believed in countless passages in her writings prove how exalted was her ideal of family life and if they also prove her constant restless yearning after some unattained unattainable good there is at least no sign of the satiety of exhausted emotion in them let us be content then that in many instances a veil should hide from us the deeper recesses of madame de stal's heart grant that there were two germaines one her father's daughter lofty-minded pure catching the infection of exalted feelings and incapable of error the other her husband's wife thrust into the fiery circle of human passion thence to emerge a little scorched and harmed the hidden centre of that dual self cannot be revealed to us but what we do know is sometimes so grand and always so great that we can afford to be indulgent when reduced to conjecture in seventeen ninety one after having paid a visit of condolence to her father at coppet madame de stal had returned to paris and made her salon the rallying point for the most distinguished constitutionals conspicuous among these in principles although not in name was de narbonne described by madame de stal herself as grand seigneur homme d'esprit courtesan et philosophe he was a brilliant and enlightened a generous and charming man his sympathies were liberal it would have been too much to expect from him that they should be subversive he had been brought up in the enervating atmosphere of the court yet had adopted many of the new ideas after having accomplished the difficult and perilous enterprise of escorting the king's aunts to rome and establishing them under the roof of the cardinal de berny he returned to paris and ranged himself on the side of the constitution his soldier soul he was an extremely gallant officer would not allow of his going any farther along the facile descent of change 
the king's abortive attempt at escape and subsequent imprisonment in the tuileries restored to narbonne all the fervour which his allegiance as a courtier might originally have lacked but he was a very intelligent man so much so that napoleon himself years later rendered justice to his sagacity he had serious tastes and a great love of knowledge and was almost as witty as talleyrand himself he was made minister of war in december seventeen ninety one and the general impression prevailed that madame de stael's influence had contributed to his appointment he was young and full of hope and proposed to himself the impossible task of encouraging the action of the assembly at the same time as he sought to reconstruct the popularity of the king he also exerted himself to prepare france for resistance to the armies of foreign invaders visited the frontier reported the state of things there to the assembly provisioned the forts re-established garrisons and organized three armies but what he could not do was to inspire anybody with confidence in himself too black for heaven too white for hell he could neither rise to the sublime ineptitude of deluded royalism nor sink to the brutal logic of facts curtly dismissed by the king at the end of three months on resigning the portfolio he resumed the sword to defend his ungrateful sovereign was his religion since in spite of his talents he did not reach the point of perceiving that there is a moment in the history of every nation when individuals must be sacrificed to principles perhaps this preoccupation of minds naturally enlightened with merely personal issues is the real key to all that was tragically mysterious in the revolution madame de stal herself deplored the fate of the king and queen with precisely the same wealth of compassion that she would have expressed on the occasion of some catastrophe involving hundreds of obscure lives it seemed as though only such sanguinary monomaniacs as robespierre or saint just only such corrupt and colossal natures as mirabeau or danton could look below the accidental circumstances of an event to its enduring elements all that was morally and vitally as distinguished from mentally and potentially best in france threw itself into passionate defence of persons while all that was strong original consistent was drawn into the fatal policy of blood a few months after narbonne's fall madame de stal endeavoured to associate him in a plan which her pity had suggested to her for the escape of the royal family she wished to buy a property that was for sale near dieppe thus furnished with a pretext for visiting the coast she proposed to make three journeys thither on the first two occasions she was to be accompanied by her eldest son who was the age of the dauphin by a man resembling the king in height and general appearance and by two women sufficiently like the queen and madame elizabeth in her third journey she would have left the original party behind and taken with her the whole of the royal family but the king and queen refused to cooperate in this romantic and courageous plan their motives were not unselfish louis the sixteenth objected to narbonne's share in the scheme and marie antoinette who regarded the double representation of the tiers etat as the cause of all her woes detested necker's daughter End of section six. section seven of madame de stal by bella duffy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Madame de Stal is Courageous for Her Friends. Part 2. When the Tuileries was invaded by the mob, Monsieur Necker, who was already at Coppet and knew that the Baron de Stal had been recalled to Sweden, wrote urging his daughter to join him. But she was chained to Paris, 
fascinated by the very scenes that revolted her and anxious to intervene if only to save she assisted with slender sympathy for the revolutionaries at the celebration of the fourteenth july in the champ de mars and was wrung with pity for the tear-stained countenance of the queen whose magnificent toilet and dignified bearing contrasted with the squalor of her cortege madame de stael's eyes were fixed with longing compassion on the figure of the king as he ascended the steps of the altar there to swear for the second time to preserve the constitution his powdered head so lately desecrated by the bonnet rouge and gold-embroidered coat struck her imagination painfully as the vain symbols of vanished ease and splendour then came the terrible night of the ninth august during which from midnight to morning the tocsins never ceased sounding i was at my window with some of my friends wrote madame de stael and every fifteen minutes the volunteer patrol of the constitutionals brought us news we were told that the faubourgs were advancing headed by santerre the brewer and vestermann nobody could foresee what would happen the next day and nobody expected to survive it all at once at seven o'clock came the terrible sound of the cannon in this first combat the swiss guards were victors the tidings partly false as afterwards proved were brought her of the massacre of lally tolendal narbonne montmorency and others of her friends and at once regardless of peril she went out in her carriage to hear if the news were true after two hours of fruitless efforts to pass she learnt that all those in whom she was most interested were still alive but in hiding and as soon as the evening came she sallied forth once more to visit them in the obscure houses where they had taken refuge later she came to have but one thought which was to save as many as she could of her friends they were unwilling at first to take shelter in her house as being too conspicuous but she would listen to no such objections two yielded to her persuasions and one of these was narbonne he was shut up with his companion in the safest room while the intrepid hostess established herself in the front apartments and there in great anxiety awaited a domiciliary visit from the authorities they were not long in coming and in demanding monsieur de narbonne to permit a search was practically to deliver up the victim madame de stael's whole mind was consequently bent on averting investigation the police agents were exceptionally ignorant and of this fact she was quick to take advantage she began by instilling alarm into them as to the violation of rights which they committed in invading the house of an ambassador and she followed this up by informing them that sweden being on the frontier of france would descend upon that offending land immediately she next passed to pleasantries and succeeded so well in cajoling her visitors that they finally allowed themselves to be gracefully bowed out four days later a false passport supplied by a friend of madame de stael allowed narbonne to escape to england the swedish ambassadress herself could easily have left france at any moment but she lingered on from day to day unwilling to quit the country while so many of her friends were in danger and she was rewarded at last by the opportunity of interfering to save jocourt who had been conveyed to the abbe now aptly named the antechamber of death madame de stael knew none of the members of the commune but with her unfailing presence of mind she remembered that one of them manuel the procureur had some pretensions to be literary these pretensions being greater than his talent madame de stael rightly concluded that he possessed sufficient vanity to be moved by solicitation she wrote to ask for an interview which was accorded her for the next morning at seven o'clock in the official's own house the hour was democratic she remarks but she was careful to be punctual her eloquence achieved an easy victory over manuel who unlike so many of his colleagues was no fanatic and on the first of september he made madame de stal happy by writing to inform her 
that thanks to his good offices jocourt had been set at liberty she now at last determined to quit france the next day but not alone resolute to the end in risking her life for that of others she consented to take the abbe de montesquion with her in the disguise of a domestic and convey him safely into switzerland a passport obtained for one of her servants was given to one of his and a place on the high road indicated as a rendezvous where the abbe was to join her suite when the next morning dawned a fresh element of terror had invaded the public mind the news of the fall of longwy and verdun had arrived and paris was in effervescence again in all the sections the tocsin was sounding and everybody whose own life was his chief preoccupation kept as quiet as possible but madame de stal could not keep quiet that was impossible for her at all times and at this moment the image paramount in her mind was that of the poor abbe waiting anxiously at his rendezvous perhaps only to be discovered if his generous deliverer delayed turning a deaf ear to all remonstrance she started in a travelling carriage drawn by six horses and accompanied by her servants in gala livery this was an unfortunate inspiration instead of filling the minds of the vulgar with awe as she had vainly hoped it aroused their vigilant suspicions the carriage had hardly passed under the portals of the hotel when it was surrounded by a furious crowd of old women risen from hell as madame de stal energetically expressed it who shrieked out that she was carrying away the gold of the nation this intelligent outcry brought a new contingent of exasperated patriots of both sexes who ordered the fugitive ambassadress to be conveyed to the assembly of the section nearest at hand she did not lose her presence of mind but on descending from the carriage found an opportunity of bidding the abbe's servant rejoin his master and tell him what had happened this step proved to be a very dangerous one the president of the section informed madame de stal that she was accused of seeking to take away proscribed royalists and that he must proceed to a roll-call of her servants one of them was missing naturally having been dispatched to save his own master and the consequence was a peremptory order to madame de stal to proceed to the hotel de ville under charge of a gendarme such a command was not calculated to inspire her with any sentiment but fear several people had already been massacred on the steps of the hotel de ville and although no woman had yet been sacrificed to popular fury there was no guarantee for such immunity lasting and as a point of fact the princesse de lamballe fell the very next day madame de stal's passage from the faubourg saint germain to the hotel de ville lasted three hours her carriage was led at a foot-pace through an immense crowd which greeted her with reiterated cries of death it was not herself they detested she says but the evidences of her luxury for the news of the morning had brought more opprobrium than ever on the execrated name of aristocrat fortunately the gendarme who was inside the carriage was touched by his prisoner's situation and her delicate condition of health and her prayers and promised to do what he could to defend her by degrees her courage rose she knew that the worst moment must be that in which she would reach the place de greve but by the time she arrived there aversion for the mob had almost overcome in her every feeling but disdain she mounted the steps of the hotel de ville between a double row of pikes and one man made a movement to strike her thanks to the prompt interposition of the friendly gendarme she was able however to reach the presence of robespierre in safety the room in which she found him was full of an excited crowd of men women and children all emulously shrieking vive la nation the swedish ambassadress was just beginning to protest officially against the treatment she met with when manuel arrived on the scene never was any apparition more opportune greatly astonished to see his late illustrious visitor in such a position he promptly undertook to answer for her until the commune had made up its mind what to do with her and conveying her and her maid to his own house 
shut them up in the same cabinet where Madame de Stael had pleaded for Jocourt. There they remained for six hours, dying of hunger, thirst, and fear. The windows of the room looked out upon the Place de Greve and consequently offered the spectacle of bands of yelling murderers returning from the prisons with bare and bleeding arms. Madame de Stael's travelling carriage had remained in the middle of the square. She expected to see it pillaged, but a man in the uniform of the National Guard came to the rescue and passed two hours in successfully defending the luggage. This individual turned out to be the redoubtable Santerre. He introduced himself later in the day to Madame de Stael and took credit for his conduct on the ground of the respect with which M. Necker had inspired him when distributing corn to the starving population of Paris. In the evening, Manuel, pallid with horror at the events of that awful day, took Madame de Stael back to her own house through streets of which the obscurity was only relieved at moments by the lurid glare of torches. He told her that he had procured a new passport for herself and her maid alone, and that she was to be escorted to the frontier by a gendarme. The next day Talion arrived, appointed by the commune to accompany her to the barriers. Several suspected aristocrats were present when he was announced. Most people under such circumstances would have taken care to be found alone, but Madame de Stael remained undaunted to the end. She simply begged Talion to be discreet, and he fortunately proved to be. A few more difficulties had to be encountered before she was fairly in safety, but at last she reached the pure air and peaceful scenes of the Jura. End of section seven.